This county museum is, uh, has been here since 1973, and it was purposely built to house a museum. Uh, prior to that, many people had donated a lot of different artifacts to the county, and a lot of them were kept at the Chamber of Commerce and at different places. And the Historical Society, which was formed in 1938, had collected quite a few things. So when this museum was approved by the Board of Supervisors and then built in 1974, um, a lot of those collections ended up here. We have a museum commission that provides oversight and I'm a county employee. And then I depend on volunteers to really help me run this museum and Shirley's been wonderful. She's been a volunteer here for many, many years. So what we try to do is tell the story about the history of El Dorado County. And one of our really wonderful collections here is a collection of Native American baskets. And we can kind of, and I do want to point out that I put on display, uh, this was the ribbons from the Marguerite Parlor uh, that were lent to us several years ago. This Native American collection that we have here, uh, the core collection was actually purchased by a woman named Francesca Aiken O'Keefe. And she bought these baskets in the 1920s. And these uh, large feasting baskets and cooking baskets and gathering baskets were being done primarily by three Native American groups that were living here in this area before the gold rush. The Washoe people were living up in the Tahoe Basin and would actually travel down into El Dorado County area during the winter months. And then in the Placerville area, we had both the Miwok people who were kind of Placerville and South, and then there were the Nisanon or Maidu who were kind of Placerville and North. And by the time these baskets were being made in the 1880s and 90s, the gold rush had totally disrupted these people's way of life. And there was a lot of mixing, and we even had the curator from the State Indian Museum come and look over our basket collection to help us give some attribution who might have made these baskets. Yeah. And she said it's very difficult. There was a lot of intermarriage, a lot of sharing of designs and ideas. Uh, the Washoe are more distinct because they're actually made a little bit differently. But the Maidu and, or Nisanan and the Miwok baskets um, were made and continued to be made for quite a few years in the very traditional manner. And they used willow, red bud for the contrasting colors, and a few other of the natural um, things around them. Uh, stands of willow would actually be tended in order to get those nice long shoots that were needed. And then the designs were taken from nature. Uh, one of the ones we like to point out is we've got a little California quail over there. Mm -hmm. And with that wonderful little top knot that quails have, and so that basket next to it was inspired, that design, by that little top notch on the um, California quail. So looking for those designs around them. The grinding rocks were used to grind acorns, and acorns were uh, very much of a staple. Uh, there's quite a process, though, to, to um, getting acorns from this state to where you can eat it. So they would be crushed and would have to be washed extensively. And then it actually would turn into kind of a mush. And our cooking basket over there on the right, you can see it's tipped towards us and it's got a repaired bottom. They could put the mush in that and these baskets were so tightly woven that they were pretty much waterproof. And then heat up the round rocks and those would be put into that basket of mush and it would actually cook it. Another kind of interesting piece over in that corner case is a duck form mm -hmm. and that was made in Yosemite and that was actually a, a form that was used uh, as a decoy. So a duck <laughs> skin would be laid over that and it would be sent out into a quiet pond and then that would cause the ducks to see, think it was a safe place to land and they were able to hunt them and get the ducks and certainly fishing and other kinds of hunting. So the Native American world here prior to the gold rush, really thousands of years, there were people living here, 
moving around seasonally and leaving their mark with um, things like the bedrock uh, grinding rocks and those kinds of things. And a lot of those bedrock grinding rocks are real indicators that people return to the same site year after year after year for hundreds of years. So a lot of stability here in this part of El Dorado, the part of California, Northern California. Well, that all changed with obviously the gold rush. When that little nugget of gold was discovered, so many people rushed in that it totally blew apart this way of life. And there still are a lot of descendants living here, but more or less became kind of assimilated into the world around them. Baseball was a big deal here in El Dorado County. There were a number of different baseball teams and a lot of the different communities had their own team. And I've got some pictures there where Kelsey had its own team, Fair Play did, Lotus did. Uh, Placerville's teams were known as the Bartlett's. And the reason is because of the Bartlett pair. Um, El Dorado County produced a huge amount of pears. And the Bartlett pear was really the, the main pear that then was packed at the Placerville fruit growers. Well, in the late 1950s, there was a pear blight. And it destroyed all of the, all the pears died. And Apple Hill really blossomed out of that because a lot of those orchard owners then switched to pay, uh, to, from pears to apples. And, uh, but our remnant of that is our uniform of the Bartlett's. And in 1925, 26, 27, they won the Foothill League Championship and got that um, so absolutely huge. enormous wow. uh, cup, cup as their award. Uh, is it silver? Is it, it is. Yeah. It's very tarnished, but it is silver. And. Um, the Foothill League appears to be somewhat kind of a semi-pro type of a league. And the different lumber companies, they also sponsored baseball teams. We have a, ba a businessman's baseball team. So all of that really indicated that there was a lot of baseball. And our little uniform is a little league uniform of the Timbers. And that's actually 1960, which doesn't seem all that long ago, but it is historic. And so kids were playing baseball. We also have swimming. Obviously here in El Dorado County, we had a lot of opportunities for recreation. And a slideshow here in the electronic frame showing some of those different swimming opportunities. Kybers had a swimming hole, uh, the beaches up at Lake Tahoe, and then swimming pools around. And we have a 1936 photograph of the Placerville pool. Oh. So people were looking for swimming. The swimsuits here are interesting. They date from about 1930, and they're both 100% wool. And the red one is the woman's, and the black one is the man's. And this was quite a contrast in style from what went before it, when women had to wear all of that fabric and had bloomers and their skirts were long. So this idea of a uh, slim-fitting, a uh, comfortable knitted wool suit was quite a contrast. <laughs> Daring. As soon as the automobile was really popular, uh, people were driving up into El Dorado County to enjoy what was here. And car camping became quite a thing where you came with your tent and we have some pictures mm -hmm. of that as well as picnics. And when you think about all of the modern equipment we have today, uh, these folks, there's this one photograph showing three women who are cooking and they just basically had to haul up their frying pan and everything. Um, and they're doing it in their long skirts and they have their, there's a little girl who's just totally wrapped up. You can just see that she got all wrapped up to keep the mosquitoes away, I'm sure. <laughs> but this was really popular and obviously continues to be so. Um, the picture on the platform is showing the Thomas Flyer, which is the automobile on the railroad tracks. And this is in the Grizzly Flat area. And the picture so shows one of those women is Georgia Leone of Leone Meadows, uh, which we'll talk about a little farther on, but wearing very much this kind of a linen duster that was there to protect your clothes underneath. Oh, cool. So the gold rush, hmm. as I said, really changed things here. 
James Marshall discovered gold on January 24th, 1848. And he and John Sutter were very interested in keeping that secret uh, because uh, they were investing in this building, this sawmill, and they were milling wood in order to build what Sutter was going to call Sutterville. Uh, so he had great plans. Well, by finding that gold nugget, word got out and people truly started rushing in. In 1848, there were a lot of really tough things going on around the world. And so people saw this as a wonderful opportunity to make their fortune. What, who really benefited from gold panning were those that were already living here in California and Oregon because they could get here within just a few months. And for instance, Placerville was really founded by a Colonel Weber who came up from Stockton and was able to find a lot of gold in Weber Creek and he went back to Stockton. So it wasn't until a year later that folks showed up from other parts of the world as well as the East Coast they got here in 1849, and they are called the 49ers. And so that's why we have a football team in San Francisco called the 49ers, because it really took them that long to get here. By the time they got here, it was hard to find gold through placer mining <coughs> using a pan. This cradle that we have here in front is a reproduction that was made based on a drawing that was published in 1848, very early on, a way of just coming up with your own tools. Well, the man who really made a, was benefiting from all of this was John Studebaker. John Studebaker came to Placerville in 1853. He was a young man, came out from Indiana, and he was going to mine for gold. However, um, a local blacksmith needed someone who could build wheelbarrows. And so he got the job, and this is one of his wheelbarrows that he built. He was here for five years, and he was able to buy and sell, or build and sell these wheelbarrows at $10 a piece, and went back to his home in Indiana with a fortune in his pocket. And he was able to invest in his wagon works, his family business. They got the um, union contract uh, with the Army during the Civil War, and Studebaker wagons took off and are found all over the place, and we'll, we'll see a couple more. Well, Studebaker came back to Placerville in 1912, and we've got a picture of that over there on the right-hand side, that group of men all with long beards, and Studebaker called them his old cronies, and they wined and dined him for three days, the Ohio House, which was the swanky hotel in town. And he really credited his experiences here in Placerville as really giving him a firm foundation for all of his future endeavors. Well, at that 1912 event, a gentleman showed him a wheelbarrow, this wheelbarrow, and asked him if this was one of his. And he said, yes, I made that. Well, that gentleman later donated that wheelbarrow to the Historical Society, and so it made its way here. And it is a little bit different. The front wheel is larger, and it has offset spokes, and is made of wood within that iron tire, which is a bit different from earlier wheelbarrows. But they held up well. A lot of different kinds of mining had to happen. There was a hydraulic mining, and we have some pictures and nozzles of that where they just washed away the hillsides in their effort to find the gold. Um, it was an, uh, an ecological disaster. All of that silt got washed into the rivers and through the American River and Sacramento River and eventually into the San Francisco Bay. And it affected the oyster beds and a lot of things in San Francisco. And that actually caused hydraulic mining to be outlawed by 1880. Hard rock mining and we've got a little model there, is what really ended up happening here. And the hard rock mining took capital. And so companies were formed, and men then started working for those companies, for those mining companies. So it was no longer really an opportunity for an entrepreneur to come out here and stand in a freezing cold stream of water and be able to get some gold.
Well, after gold became harder and harder to find, a lot of people looked around and saw timber all over that with, that was still standing. Some of those early pictures of Placerville really show such a different view than what we have today because they basically cut down all the trees. Uh, they used the trees to build houses. They also used it for fuel, for the stamp mills, for the mining, all of those kinds of things. We have some pictures here. There at the top are men who are actually cutting trees with axes. And that took a long time. And they would stand on one of these springboards. They'd drive that into the bark and stand on it and basically just work it, chopping down that tree by hand. Hmm. So the invention of other kinds of ways of cutting down trees, certainly the two-man saws, and then when the chainsaw came in, that was a huge game changer. That really meant that they could cut much more quickly. Railroads were seen as the most effective way of moving timber to the mill. So once they had those logs down, they could load them onto uh, these narrow gauge railroads and those would haul things, these, this wood to the, timber, to the mill. The cable was an invention of the, uh, what became the Michigan Cal Lumber Company and it went across the American River. And in 1904, that was so innovative, they had a mill called Pino Grande on the north side of the river in the Mosquito area. What they needed was a way to get all of that lumber to the south side of the river where it could be put on the Southern Pacific Railroad line. So this cable allowed them to move it car by car across and it was about 1,200 feet above the American River. And that was so innovative and less costly it made it into a Scientific American article in 1904. They were so impressed with that. There still is Cable Road in um, Camino that was the road out to that bluff. The one end of the side of the cable burned, and by that time, this was in about 1949, and by that time, uh, diesel trucks really had come into their own, and rather than repair the cable, they basically just started hauling all of this timber and lumber in, with diesel trucks. And our little railroads that we had here in the county that were started up by the lumber companies had to close because they were in violation of federal law. Um, these two railroads, the Diamond and Caldor Railroad and then the Michigan Cal's Railroad, which was known as the, um, the Camino, Placerville, and Lake Tahoe Railroad, they all used Lincoln Pin uh, to couple the two cars together. And what that meant is that you push these cars together and a man had to stand there and drop a pin in to catch them. And there were a lot of injuries. And that had been outlawed actually pretty early on to a Janey coupler that was automatic. And uh, for some reason, the inspector showed up in 1852, I think, 1952, and basically said, you're shut down unless you convert. Well, neither railroad wanted to spend the money to convert. So they hmm. stopped those railroads hmm. and both of the railroad lines actually pulled up their tracks. Now the CP and LT, the Camino and Placerville Lake Tahoe Railroad continued to operate between Camino and Placerville. And as long as Southern Pacific would come to Placerville from Sacramento and Folsom, they met the train with their lumber. Southern Pacific decided in 1986 that it was just not economical to have a train anymore. One of the issues was the growth in El Dorado County and the amount of traffic <coughs> and people caused Southern Pacific to put a, a 10 mile an hour speed limit on all trains coming up. So it took all day, basically, to get up here, get a load and get back. And so 1986 was when the last train actually ran. <clears throat> now we have, the museum has a group called the El Dorado Western Railroad, which are volunteers that are operating uh, inspection cars, we've got a picture of them there, um, on the old Southern Pacific tracks between El Dorado and Missouri Flat. And we are in the process of restoring full-size train equipment and hope to get that running soon. And the pair safe was something that you could put on your back porch and you could put food in there and it would actually be protected from mice and from various bugs 
And you could even put the legs of your pie safe into little cans of water and it would keep the ants from getting up into it. Mm. And then our icy ball cabinet is an interesting device, which is actually a little freezer that doesn't require electricity. It actually depends on ammonia. And the fact that you could heat ammonia up and as it cooled, it actually created this frozen area inside. So you could freeze water. And this was a 24 hour thing of where there was a special little burner that you heated up the one side and then as it cooled it moved into the other side uh -huh. what, and what was this one this part that's of the it. burner right so that's burner? one of the sides so the burner you'd set that over a burner that came with it I see. and then it would move into there so it was really seen as a very innovative and for some reason the radio corporation the crosley radio corporation saw that bought the patent and then they distribute sold these for in the 20s and 30s and as we're sitting there in power outages, <laughs> thinking about something like that becomes more and more appealing. <laughs> we have two pictures here of Amelia Celio and Mary Bakke who were involved with their families of moving their cattle seasonally. The Studebaker wagon here is actually a sheep herder's wagon and then a wonderful little Studebaker Junior. And this was something the Studebaker Corporation sold as a toy as well as illustrating what they could sell and we have a picture of betsy ripley she was a volunteer here many years ago and this was her as a little girl with a goat pulling that <laughs> wagon ron schofield who did this work and he was able to determine it was pretty dilapidated when it first got here he was able to determine because of the metal fixtures hmm. that it had been a farm wagon that then was adapted to become the sheep herders wagon and that sheep herder, he would actually um, live with his flock of sheep. So this was his home, and he moved around with the sheep, and he would stand here, and probably mules would be hauling it from here. These were found by a metal detecting club who went to areas that they knew were gold rush camps in the 1848-1849 period, and we're able to find a lot of these artifacts that indicate what those miners were using, what the material culture of mining was. And some of the items we think probably were lost. Others might have truly been discarded. They were just done with them. The bottles were empty, so they threw them out. Um, but it is an interesting kind of perspective on what miners would have had with them and some of the very early photographs are helpful in helping to identify what they are. You'll have a chance to look at this as we move on but uh, the shelf below that interesting conch shell. This is a, a artifact from Gold Rush days that was donated to the museum uh, just a couple of years ago. It was um, a conch shell was used by the vigilante committee here in Placerville. And it was modeled on the San Francisco Vigilante Committee. And one of the things when reading about these committees, there was so much concern about how to enforce law and order. Um, and a lot of people wanted to be out there mining for gold and didn't want to worry about trying to take care of the bad guys. So the Vigilante Committee was actually more of a, like a posse that worked with the sheriff of the county. The gentleman who blowed that conch shell to call the vigilante committee in 1852 actually got appointed judge of El Dorado County a couple of years later and was a judge here for 30 years. And then the bottom shelf are some things from James Marshall. Right now our transportation room is off uh, the tour uh, primarily because of the last couple of years We've had a lot of donations, and I unfortunately don't have the couple of people that were helping me with the accessioning process. We've got a couple of dollhouses here you can look at. The one dollhouse was a 25-year project of a couple who traveled the world. It was just within a 25-year period where there were very fine homes here, and the, the really nice things were available. Uh, the rosewood piano, for instance, is a very fine piece that would have been quite a luxury item. The dresses here belonging to Stella 
Uh, she attended uh, many of the different clubs, as I mentioned, the Shakespeare Club. Upon her death, she also left a legacy of a, a scholarship at the high schools, which is actually still in effect. The dishes and silverware were part of her wedding china, which she purchased in San Francisco. And she was very much of a musician. Uh, we have a picture of her playing a guitar, her guitar and mandolin there on the settee. And then she was a regular opera attendee. And this opera coat dates from about 1918, 1920. It's beautiful. Stella was married to Perry Tracy, who had the Tracy shoe store. And we have some shoes. And we look at those shoes and just wonder how anyone could actually wear those. But this <laughs> Tracy shoe store was in the building that still says Tracy. It's the Heyday Cafe now. Uh, so that was still there. Georgia uh, Leone, who had the ranch at what they called Mountain Meadow, which became Leone uh, Meadows. And her mother was Lucinda Nail. And her mother lived in Grizzly Flat. And her husband had been killed accidentally when her girls were very young. And Lucinda basically made a living as a seamstress, as a dressmaker. So if in 1910 you wanted the latest fashion, you might go to Lucinda uh, because it took a lot of skill to create those um, dresses that were stylish with the stays and you needed a corset and all of those kinds of things. And the old Singer sewing machine. Um, singers really became very prevalent after the Civil War because Singer came up with that a great idea of buying things on layaway. So you could purchase a Singer sewing machine and then have a contract where you paid $5 a month or something. So a lot of families ended up with Singer sewing machines. Was this one of her dresses that she made? This, this one? We don't know actually who made that or who even wore it. It came to the museum's collection, and it's just a beautiful handmade piece. And hand embroidered. Absolutely. Beautiful. The um, bedroom over here, this bed, was purchased in Bruner's in 1878 in Sacramento. And it was actually for um, uh, a man bought it, a bedroom set, for his new wife. And they lived in Indian diggings, so which is pretty, pretty darn rural. Wow but he had a very fine bedroom set for her. The crazy quilt on the bed, crazy quilts were a real popular uh, craft in the 1880s, 90s. And this one on the bed, you might be able to see, um, was actually made in three phases. The upper portion of that has ribbons in it, and she even included, we know it was made by Sarah Ingham, she included a ribbon that commemorated the arrival of the Southern Pacific Railroad to Placerville. It got finished to Placerville in 1888, um, and she got that ribbon in there. The lower half are made out of darker fabrics, satins and silks and velvets, and then the backing fabric actually is more of a 1930s fabric. So I think all of us might have experience with quilts that get made over time and by different hands. And then the signature quilt here at the end of the bed um, is a wonderful example of how quilts were made to have people remember. And these have names written in an iron-based ink, not from here. And the family who donated it believed that it was from where it came from. And they made this quilt for their ancestor who then brought the quilt out here with them. And so it was a way to remember her friends and family that she left behind. Stella Tracy's baby thing. Stella kept everything, I think. And Ruby is her doll. And there's a picture of Stella holding her Ruby. Uh, Ruby, she kept very good care of Ruby. She really survived very well. And then we have a case here of some of the baby items that I think um, continue to be saved. Uh, handmade baby items that get worn a few times and then put away in a box up in the attic. Um, so some of these are items from the museum's collection. <coughs> kind of move on here to the general store. Now, especially with kids, we talk about the general store. 
the difference between shopping then and shopping now. And what we are shopping in now is really was at that time called a self-serve grocery store. Piggly Wiggly was the innovative grocery store chain that came up with self-serve. But prior to that, what you did was you gave your list to this gentleman and then he would fill it. And there's a lot of very familiar products that you can see. We have a display on this, on the other side, uh, the goat doctor, you might be familiar with him. He lived in Mosquito and he was a healer who believed in the healing properties of goat skin, goat milk, and he kind of had almost a mystical laying on of hands and he did heal people. Doctors sent people to him for healing and they came from all over the world. Several years ago, um, Gloria Hawkinsmith compiled a lot of those testimonies into a book and he really truly did heal and people remembered that. What was his name? His name was um, Frank Andre. Andre. Frank Andre. Did they have a special name for him or a nickname? The Goat Doctor was what he my, was known my as. My husband's family went to the uh, Yes, family. absolutely. Stories about that. Yeah. yeah. And he did. He did heal people. Amazing. Miracle. And then we've got an exhibit about the one-room schoolhouses here in El Dorado County. Um, the California Constitution called for the first one, 1850, that if a community had six kids of school age, you had to provide a teacher, a school building, and elect a school board. And so that occurred as populations increased in areas and more and more families were there and more kids. And so some of these one-room schoolhouses, we have a picture of the Mosquito one-room schoolhouse, and she's there pointing to a map of El Dorado County. Um, we're really, could be quite a great place to learn. Uh, the Retired Teachers Association published the book Mother Load of Learning in 1990, and it is a wonderful resource for the teachers, the students, and descriptions, oral histories about these one-room schoolhouses. And we've got a picture here. This is the Upper Placerville School in 1906. And we've been using this to talk with school kids. You kind of can get them to focus in on the picture and look at what is the same and what is different. And obviously, the desk arrangements were different in this idea of having your desks bolted to the floor. You didn't get any of this moving around. Um, and looking at the pump organ, a stove pipe, and the way they are dressed. And it's kind of a neat way to engage kids in what was the same and what was different. And we have a couple of rules for teachers that we got from the um, one room schoolhouse in Old Sacramento. And the 1915 one is very clear on what a teacher is not allowed to do. And one of those things was to be married. Really? Many school if districts you were a woman. didn't want women. <laughs> yet you're absolutely right. If the you were a woman, you couldn't be married. If you were a man, you could be. But different school districts handled that differently. It was true for nurses, too. And it's interesting that the one-room schools were still in operation when I was in elementary school in the 1940s. And there we, were still one-room school houses when I got my teaching credential in 1971. I mean, well, in we actually Sonoma had County, the uh, Indian County. Diggings one-room yes. schoolhouse visit mm -hmm. here last month, and they were fascinated by this. And it's, mm -hmm. it was a class of 13 that I think ranged from first to seventh grade. Margaret Kelly was a teacher for over 50 years. She did not marry. And she was a principal, and she ran for school superintendent, although she didn't win. And Margaret Kelly was a very good friend of James Marshall. And in fact, this picture here that I'm, I'm gonna lift it up, Margaret Kelly is there, and James Marshall is there, and I believe this is the 1886 Native Daughters of the Golden West, um, kind of inaugural event in Sacramento. And she, he, um, Margaret Kelly brought him as her guest. And she really believed in supporting the impact and the contributions that James Marshall had to the whole development of California. 
Aww. Heather Burnett, her grandfather, Henry Morey, ran the Hangtown Band for many years. Yeah, and, and his <laughs> trumpet is there. Yeah. Um, Henry Morey's grandfather, H.S. Morey, um, actually was a bandmaster in the um, Union Army during the Civil War. And that's his coronet. But we've got, uh, Placerville liked its parades. We've got a lot of historical photographs of parades. And that Hangtown Band or the Placerville Band are always in it. Mary Ann Schroth, who was a longtime volunteer here at the museum, she died last year at the age of 97. And her father was in World War I. So uh, Wilson Bryan is his name. And these are some of the artifacts that she was able to lend to us. And then Mary Ann's husband fought in World War II, he actually flew a P-61, which was known as a Widowmaker in the Pacific, and it was one of the very earliest planes with radar, not very many of them. And then her brother was a crew on a B-24. Another one of our women of influence that we talk about is Dr. Jean, Dr. Jean Babcock, that you might be familiar with. Uh, she was a very early woman doctor here in Placerville. And she ran into a lot of prejudice. Um, in fact, the main hospital was the sanatorium on uh, Gloma Street, and she was not allowed to treat patients there. Well, what Dr. Jean did was she and several other doctors in the area actually set up Marshall Hospital. So she is considered one of those founding members of the Marshall Hospital and um, kind of see that as, okay, if you're not gonna let me do this, I'm gonna do this, and she was very successful. They did this as an advertising photo to show that your Model T could go anywhere a horse could go. And we know that's 1913 because that's when the courthouse was finished. Um, she went on to have a Dodge dealership on Main Street. Uh, in 1919, she went to France while the American Expeditionary Force was still in France and Germany after the armistice. Uh, this was while the Treaty of Versailles was being negotiated and all those troops had to stay put. Well, she joined the women's service of the YMCA and they ran canteens in Europe. And she was really very involved with that and there's a picture of her with General Pershing who really complimented these women who were serving at these canteens because it really made a big difference to those soldiers that were stationed there. When she came back, she got to Detroit in um, about November of 1919, and she bought herself a brand new Dodge Touring car, and she and one of her friends actually drove to Placerville on what became the, Link or what was the Lincoln Highway at that time. And she says that she was advised to not do this, much too dangerous for a woman to do that trip on her own. And she said they had absolutely no problems. It was a delightful experience and it was a wonderful way to see the country. And she said it was a great experience to top off this whole um, experience that she had in France. She went on to marry a California Highway Patrolman and then came back to Placerville upon her retirement.